First of all, <coughs> let me thank the Honorable Vice-Chancellor for having given me this opportunity of being present amongst you today and to be able to share with you some of my thoughts on the topic which is Pakistan at 70, devolution and democracy. I will start with devolution. And I will start with devolution for the simple fact that I believe that the creation of Pakistan was on the basis of federalism. If you were to look at our history, I think you would find that what I'm saying substantiates it. Yes, the two-nation theory was there, the two-nation theory is there. But I would like to take you through a different prism, the prism of federalism, while viewing the two-nation theory. In 1909 and in 1919, particularly the Montague reforms and the movement of 1909 set the basis for federalism in our area. And as, as I said that the two-nation theory is there, I don't deny the two-nation theory. One cannot deny it. But I'm looking at the two-nation theory now through the prism of federalism. And when I say that, I take you a little further. And I say that what was the demand of the Muslim League? The demand of the then Muslim League was that it was asking for more provinces, more Muslim provinces. From here, let us go a step further. And let us come to 1927. The 1927 proposals that came in which Qaeda Azam, one of the founders of this college, played a very leading and prominent role. And in the 1927 proposals, he agreed to the fact of giving up the old in Muslim League demand of a separate electorate if Sarhad and Balochistan were made into provinces and if Sindh was separated from Bombay. Let us take the journey a little further. The 1919 Act was rejected by a majority of the parties. But the only portion that was acceptable was pertaining to the provinces. And therefore, under the 1919 Act in 1921, Provincial Assembly elections were held. And then subsequently, if you look at all the documents and if you look at all the legal instruments that came into existence, if you look at the Government of India Act of 1935, that was essentially in terms of provinces and it was giving and granting provincial autonomy. And the 1935 Act remained a part of Pakistan's constitution in the initial, till such time as we were able to frame our own constitution. 
But then it does not end over here. What was the Kaid trying to achieve? The Kaid was trying to achieve because he knew that in terms of the population, it would not be possible in terms of demography, it would not be possible to meet the Hindu metrics. And therefore he wanted to compensate this through the federal metrics of having more provinces that were Muslim in nature. And he spoke of equal provincial autonomy to all the provinces, which meant that essentially the old provinces like Bengal and Punjab would not be at a higher pedestal than the new provinces that came into being. And then let us look at the very creation of Pakistan. What is the essence of federalism? The essence of federalism is that the provinces say that they want to give up a bit of their power, a bit of their rights, a bit of their sovereignty, and they want to transfer that to a federal to a federation. And look at the creation of Pakistan. It is a classical example. The members of the provincial assembly of Punjab and Sindh said they want the creation of Pakistan. There was a referendum in Sarhad, as it was then known as, and Sarhad said it wanted to be a part of the Federation of Pakistan. And for Balochistan, there was the Quetta Masaliat, which said it wanted to be a part of the Federation of Pakistan. So therefore, the very creation, the very basis on which Pakistan came into being, was federal where the provinces said that we will give up our sovereignty we will give up our rights we will give up certain of our obligations in order to join the federation of pakistan and that is what qaid -e azam had envisaged and that is why pakistan was to be a welfare state a progressive state. If you want to look at what Pakistan's shape was to be, the speech of the Qaid-e Azam of 19 August 1947 gives you the grand gnome of what the state was to be. But it was unfortunate. It was tragic. It was sad that we lost him so soon and that till today we are still a nation looking for our moorings. Because the very purpose for which the Qaeda had created the state of the federal state of Pakistan was changed. The federation was changed to one unit and the welfare state was changed to a national security state. The basis for the creation of Pakistan, that was federalism, was done away with. The basis for the creation of Pakistan, as the Qaeda had envisaged, of being a progressive welfare state, was also done away with. And I will not go then into the history of how in order to keep the levers of power in Islamabad or first in Karachi and then in Islamabad 
how the civil military bureaucracy colluded, how the landed aristocracy in terms of Pakistan's politicians colluded in becoming toadies of the civil military bureaucracy. And as and when it was required, Pakistan's judiciary lent a helping hand. All military takeovers, all abrogations of the Constitution were upheld. And it was only when the usurper had left that you saw lofty judgments coming. But I will not even go into that. Because you are aware of that. I would just stick to the fact that all the constitutions that came, whether it was the 56, whether it was, and I don't consider the 62 a constitution, but nonetheless it's there, the interim constitution of 72, the 73 constitution, their all essence was on federalism. Some of them had two lists, some of them had three lists. But the mindset in Pakistan continued to be that of a centrist mindset. I don't want to open up a new chapter on this, but let me very quickly just say to you in, by just pointing that there is a lot of controversy that surrounds the separation of East Pakistan. I don't want to go into that at this stage, although I can. But I will just take you back in history to the first point of order that was raised in the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan and that first point of order was raised by a minor minority member and he said that what type of a democracy are you talking about? Where the language of the majority of the people of the country is not the national language. This was the first point of order that was raised in Pakistan's Constituent Assembly. That the majority is of East Pakistan, Bengali is the language, and you're denying them the status of a national language. The seeds for the separation of East Pakistan were sown that very day. And you gave further fertilizer to it when you brought in the concept of parity. You negated federalism in West Pakistan and you brought in the concept of parity in order to con continue with your stranglehold. But as I said, I will not venture into that. But I want you just to bear that in mind. I want you to bear that in mind because you are the upcoming generation of Pakistan. You must know your history. And it is a sad day that I should be in such a beautiful surroundings of, the universe, of, of a university. And I have to say, 
that the course books that are being taught to students at the, at the college level, particularly the history books, portray a false history of Pakistan. There are chapters, there are portions of Pakistan's democratic struggle which do not find mention in any of the history books. Whether they are in Sindh, whether they are in Punjab, whether they are in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or they are in Balochistan. And I am saying this with the fullest of confidence because I have read those books as of a year ago. You still have history books which eulogize jihad. You still have history books which say what are the advantages of dictatorship and what are the advantages of democracy. And you'll be shocked to learn that even today I'm now forgetting whether it is in Sindh or Punjab where this history, where this uh, uh, chapter is present. Even today, that book shows 11 advantages of dictatorship and 8 advantages of democracy. So therefore, if you want to teach your children your future generations a warped history, a concocted history. How do you expect them to identify with this motherland? The identification with the motherland comes when you have ownership of it. When I'm detached, when I'm not told what my history is, and you'll be shocked. The question of separation of East Pakistan in these history books is dealt in one paragraph. If I'm a student and I have not lived through those traumatic days, In one paragraph, what am I to understand? But this has all been done in order to perpetuate the status quo, in order to produce citizens which do not have the capacity to question, to produce citizens who will go along and who believe that every deviation from the democratic process has been a fair deviation. And that every deviation from the democratic process has been in the benefit of Pakistan. I can go into the details of those deviations. I can go into the pitfalls of those devi deviations. In fact, where we stand today is because of those deviations. Each era has its own, which has contributed to the dismantling of my nation. But I would like to end on a positive note. I believe the people of Pakistan are very resilient. 
I believe the people of Pakistan are very industrious. I believe the people of Pakistan are perhaps even better than the citizens of London who braved the blitz. When I look at universities abroad and when I get opportunities such as these to come to universities at home, I find this fire in the in the eyes of our youth. I see they are inspired, I see they are motivated. But their motivation needs to be challenged, channeled. They need to be given the facts and when I say needs to be channeled, do not get me wrong. I don't want to make you, take you from one mold into another mold. I need for you to be able to question, to be able to question your government, to be able to question your parliament, to be able to question your universities, because if there is no academic freedom in universities, universities are like a graveyard. I need this generation of Pakistan, if Pakistan is to survive, and which it will, inshallah, then I need you to be able to question, to be able to say that this is right and this is wrong. We will accept this and we will not accept this. That is the channelization I'm talking about. Pakistan has come a long way. But one thing is very clear, that if there is any attempt at any stage, because that centrist mindset is still there, if there is any attempt at any stage to roll back the devolutionary process, it will spill disaster for the Federation. The smaller provinces are not ready to concede to the autonomy that they have got. And apart from the ownership of their own nat natural resources, there is a political advantage to this. Yes, the insurgency movement in Balochistan is still there. But the Baloch nationalist who believes to work within the constitutional framework, today he has a very big argument in terms of the 18th Amendment. That I remained within the process, that I remained within the constitutional ambit, and I was able to get ownership of 50% of my oil and gas from the federal government. But for God's sake, those in Islamabad who sit and conspire, if you think that you can manipulate the constitution and change the interpretation to mean something else, then learn from history. Otherwise, history will give you a lesson which generations to come will haunt us. But as I said, I'm optimistic. I do not say that the present democracy is without fault. There are a number of issues. There's the issue of governance, there's the issue of transparency, there's the issue of systems. But I still believe that no matter how flawed a democracy, it is better than dictatorship. The Federation cannot 
cannot now experience another experiment. And I look forward for the second civilian transfer of power to take place. And while concluding, let me say for my young friends one thing. That the democratic process is not like a light switch. You can't switch it on and say that Raza Rabani will be an honest man, that Shahnaz Wazir Ali Saiba will be an honest lady. It is a process. And each subsequent election will eliminate the corrupt Raza Rabanis. This is the beauty of democracy. The system itself over a period of time exposes individuals and exposes parties. And they are relegated to the dustbin of history. So let us with that spirit move forward and let us look forward to building a strong, prosperous, progressive federal Pakistan. Thank you.